Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight for our webcast, Time to Stop Playing the Breed ID Game. I'm Jesse Guglielmo, Education Specialist with Maddie's Fund. We have two speakers for you tonight. Our first speaker tonight is Caitlin Quinn. Caitlin is the Director of Operations at Hearts Speak, an organization dedicated to uniting art and advocacy to increase the visibility of shelter animals. Prior to joining Hearts Speak, Caitlin was the Assistant Director at Animal Farm Foundation. Caitlin's main goal in life is to support those working in animal welfare to do all they can to increase visibility for the animals in their care and to strive towards the best practices in language and communication related to animal sheltering. Our second speaker is Kristen Arbach, the Deputy Chief Animal Services Officer at the Austin Animal Center. Prior to this position, Caitlin was the Assistant Director at the Fairfax County Animal Shelter where she helped overturn pit bull adoption restrictions, doubled the adoptions, and cut euthanasia in half. In addition to these successes, Kristen has been featured in numerous national publications for her written pieces and presentations on topics such as breed labeling, reducing shelter intake, innovative foster care, and more. Before we start tonight, let's talk about a few housekeeping items. Please take a look at the left side of your screen where you'll see a Q&A window. That's where you'll ask questions during the presentation. Please get your questions in early. Questions submitted late in the presentation may not be processed in time for a response. Additionally, make sure to check out the resource widget at the bottom of your screen, where you can find a Breed Labels eBook, which you can open and download as you like. If you need help with your connection during the presentation, you can click on the Help widget at the bottom of your screen. This presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours should you wish to view it again. Kristen and Caitlin, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Jesse. Um, my name is Kristen Auerbach, um, and I'm here with Caitlin Quinn. And we're going to tell you, we thought before we started, we would tell you a little bit about ourselves and how we became invested um, in uh, getting rid of free labels uh, for dogs in animal shelters. Um, my, I actually am currently the uh, Deputy Chief Animal Services Officer at Austin Animal Center. And Austin, uh, last year we saved 96.5% of the about 17,000 animals that came through our doors. Um, we're a very large open access municipal shelter, um, and we have anywhere from 700 to 1,400 animals in our system at any year. Prior it, at any time, prior to that, um, I was the assistant director at the Fairfax County Animal Shelter, and that was where um, this issue first came to my attention. I had started in animal welfare uh, two decades earlier in a small shelter in Ohio, and back then, in the community and in the shelter, we didn't have a shelter software system, and we didn't have breed labels um, on, on shelter animals. We called them mutts or Heinz 57s, and some of you may remember this language. Um, some of you may still use it. And so when I came back into animal welfare to Fairfax County in 2012, um, al almost two decades later, I, I was really surprised when I saw um, that all the dogs in our care were really be, be not just being given uh, kind of arbitrary breed labels, um, but that those labels were being used to kind of define the dogs in our care. Um, and I also saw when I got to Fairfax that we had um, uh, adoption restrictions on pit bull dogs, um, dogs that were labeled as um, pit bulls in the shelter. and. So our kennel cards not, not only said breed labels, but they said pit bull rules apply. And I watched in my first weeks in, in this position, I watched um, potential adopters walk by those kennels, and that sign um, would act like a stop sign. Um, and what, what was really heartbreaking is that I saw uh, countless adopters walking by those kennels, seeing those words, and not even looking at the dog behind the sign. And that seemed like a really um, fundamental problem to saving the animals in our care. And um, so it, I got the opportunity to visit Animal Farm Foundation in early 2013, where I met, um, where I got to spend time with Caitlin. Um, and we, we actually had an in-depth conversation about the problems of uh, shelter software companies um, making us 
label dogs using a primary breed identifier, um, not just for pit bull dogs, but for all dogs. And so that's sort of how I came into this topic um, in 2013. And I'll turn it over to Caitlin to tell you a little bit about her background. Thank you, Kristen. Hi, everybody. Um, so as you heard, I spent uh, the first seven years of my career in animal welfare at Animal Farm Foundation, where um, our mission was specific to pit bull dogs, but I would say that the, the research and the policies that we were um, dealing with most often were applicable to all of the animals in our shelters, and particularly the dogs. So the issue of breed labeling sort of came about for us when we realized that um, when we were visiting shelters across the country, even just the term and the label pit bull was getting applied really subjectively. And that, so that's sort of what drew us to start to investigate further um, what was going on with, with these labels and sort of the, the box that we were being forced into as an industry by having to choose a label to begin with, especially for a lot of the dogs in our care whom we had no idea what their parentage or their history was when they came into the sheltering system. So that's sort of where um, the birth of that sort of uh, line of thought came from specific to Animal Farm Foundation. And um, we're going to start in a moment with a little bit of research that Animal Farm has spent um, a lot of time collecting and sort of cataloging. And you'll see that in the um, ebook that is available to you all tonight. Um, but before we start, we just wanted to sort of kick things off um, by giving just sort of a state of state of the state of things <laughs> um, to say that we're not uh, going to say tonight that there's no such thing as a breed. Pure breeds of dogs certainly do exist. Um, we're not disputing that at all. What we are going to talk about is when we don't know that a dog is a purebred dog, um, where we need to spend more of our time and resources rather than standing around and guessing and looking at, you know, this dog's tail and this dog's ears and trying to breed label them in a way that isn't ultimately helping families. Um, unite with their, their new best friend. Um, it's also important that we're all on the same page that um, most estimates point to at least 75% or more of the dogs in our shelters being mixed breed. And it is also, I think, a good time to just remind ourselves that um, community members are always looking to us as the experts. And I know sometimes we feel more or less equipped in that role um, as the experts for the community, but I think we've all had the experience of, you know, first getting getting your job in animal welfare and, and how many days or hours or minutes did it take before um, friends and family and friends of friends were sort of coming out of the woodwork to ask you <laughs> every question that they had about, about their own pets. And so it's just a good reminder um, that we have a certain responsibility to sort of try to go forward with the most accurate information possible and the most accurate information available to us. So I know um, I'm on the East Coast, if anybody else is. I know it's, I know it's late at night, but we're going to talk about a little, bit of, a little bit of data and a little bit of research. Um, and I promise it's, it's more fun than I'm making it sound at the moment. Um, so the first thing that I always like to talk about is this idea of um, the way that we relate to each other about dogs. So I think the most common question that not only are we asked as people working in this field, but also just the most common question um, that we all have um, for other dog owners is what kind of dog is that? And I think that that's become just a really friendly, kind way of showing interest in someone else's pets in sort of reaching out and extending that olive branch and saying, um, you know, I, I love dogs, and I see that you have one, and so tell me more about them. Um, and that's what I think we really mean by that, is tell me more about your dog. Uh, but that it's taken the form of what kind of dog is that. And what I think that we need to start to ask ourselves, not just as community members, but as members of this animal welfare community who are looked to as the experts, is um, what do the answers to that question mean? To, the, to our potential adopters and to our community members. So what do we think that the answers to those questions are going to help with in terms of um, matchmaking and adopting out animals? And that's just something for us to have in, in the back of our minds as we start to answer that question. 
So the first thing that I think um, is important for all of us to know is that um, in the canine genome, there are approximately 20,000 genes that make up a dog. Um, and this is all based on research uh, that was done at Western University um, and them sort of putting together a, a really nice catalog of, of information on the canine genome. And there's tons of information on this particular topic available from the National Canine Research Council and Animal Farm Foundation. Um, you'll find some of that uh, in the in ebook the e that we'll make sure everybody um, gets a link to. So of those 20,000 genes, variation across only 50 of them determines what is referred to as breed-defining physical characteristics. So the best way to think about that is what we see on the outside of the dog. And when we think about the, the percentage that 50 genes is of, of that 20,000, that means that it's less than 1%. Um, in fact, it's a quarter of 1% of the dog's genes are determining their physical features. And it's a really important thing for us to keep in mind when we are looking at the dogs in our care and proposing to make, um, you know, guesses or predictions about them simply based on the way that they look. This is one of my favorite um, images, this of the, the sort of tip of the iceberg moment, uh, and a good way, I think, to think about this. Um, the other thing that is really important for all of us to know is that that set of 50 genes that are associated with the physical appearance is different from the set of genes that um, determine things like brain development and function. So we also need to separate in our minds this idea that the way that a dog looks is somehow connected to the way that a dog acts. Um, and I know this is a really tough concept, but I think it's, it's important for us to remember that even within your bred groups, there's a lot of variation um, in terms of personality and characteristics. And that, that could be a, a presentation in and of itself. Um, but these are the important highlights for us to all sort of move forward with. So the other thing that we wanted to introduce is that um, this is not necessarily a brand new idea. The idea that um, referring to dogs in our shelters should probably be more about the experiences that we're having with those dogs or the, um, the information that we're finding out while they're in our care rather than our guests at their breed. So this um, wonderful quote, which I think is really um, sort of got me interested when I first started to do this work in exploring more about this concept of removing breed labels and what we could do to uh, better get to know the dogs in our care, um, was made by Dr. Amy Martyr. And, um, Believe it or not, she actually put out this statement and this quote in 2008. And I, I, when I was thinking about that tonight, I had to remind myself that 2008 was almost 10 years ago. Um, and that, you know, there have, have been nine years between then and now where we've discovered so much more scientifically. There's been much more research. Um, and we've really come a long way in terms of the way that we're handling that information within our industry but that it's not necessarily a, a brand new concept. And to throw it back a little bit further, there was a, a study done in the 1960s that really started to hint at this and, and started and is really the, um, the basis of all of the research that has since been done. So uh, this is one of my favorite games to play when we give this presentation at conferences. Uh, and it is for us to imagine that these two puppies came into your shelter today. Um, they're about 20 pounds. Uh, they are black and white. And thinking about today what we would call those, those puppies in our shelter. Um, I know that, that we can't all have a, a big discussion about it, but I'll tell you that some of the answers that I hear most often are um, lab mix. I hear a lot. I think um, I hear other very general things like hound mix. Kristen, do you hear anything um, often when you give this presentation? Yeah, I mean, we I hear hound mix, um, <laughs> lab mix, just sort of general. Uh, we've heard we've heard pit bull mix um, rarely. I, there's some few other ones too. I think right. 
Yeah, I, I, those are the ones that I hear called out the most often. Uh, once in a while I hear border collie mix or some Yeah, border of collie mix. mix. That's the one. Yeah, border collie mix. Yeah, <laughs> that one. Um, so those those are the ones that when Kristen and I sort of just ask people to shout out, those are the ones that get shouted out the quickest and the most often. Um, and what I think is most interesting about that is that we really have fallen back, I think, as as our industry has grown, as we've gotten more information, we've fallen back on even more vague breed labels um, in a lot of cases. So we, we do just generally choose um, sort of a breed category like hound um, and, and apply that rather broadly. So the big, the big reveal moment is that um, these are the parents of those puppies. So this is a purebred Cocker Spaniel and a purebred Basenji. Um, and this is from, again, a 1965 book by Scott and Fuller on the genetics and social behavior of the dog. So what they did um, was cross these first, these parents, and get those puppies, which you just saw. And um, you can see, and I'll go back just a moment just so you can really absorb <laughs> the big difference uh, between parents and, and children there. And then what they did is go a step further. And um, they did second generation crosses. And what you'll see next is that there was even more difference in the second generation. So these are now the Wait, does that mean children. they does that mean they bred the puppies to each other? No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> so it means that they they crossed a purebred cocker spaniel and a, a purebred Basenji and then continued to cross litters of those, but not the same, like not brothers and sisters. Got it. Okay, <laughs> but all, okay, got it. all Basenji and all Cocker Spaniel mixes. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, yeah, none of them so, look alike. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what's important to remember about this is that in the end, what they came up with was 72 puppies that were crossed in that way. Um, and again, these, these puppies only have Basenji and Cocker Spaniel in their background. So... I know that there are typically a lot of questions about um, DNA tests and things like that, and we'll, we're absolutely going to get into that. But I think it's important to remember that even when you get results that may list, you know, one or two or three breeds, um, we, we're not quite sure how, how far back those go sometimes. And DNA tests have gotten much, much better, and so we, we can trace some of that. But um, it's still really interesting to me that you could end up with a, a final litter of puppies that looks so very different from the grandparents who, and, and you know, staying within a relatively closed gene pool. So I want to quickly just explain why that is, because this can be sort of a difficult um, concept. But it's really important for us to remember that once, um, even when you're mixing purebred dogs of two different breeds, once that puppy has more than more than a, one purebred parent, a, a different breed pool, um, that puppy is no longer a member of either mom or dad's breed. They're, they're a new mixed breed puppy, totally individual, um, and there's, it's going to be harder and harder to try to make the kind of predictions that we are trying to make based on breed labels at the moment. So, again, really quickly, um, we want to discuss some of the other research that was done um, to reinforce some of that, that basic uh, genetic information. So, one of the first studies that was um, came about in, in 2009, I believe, was from Dr. Victoria Voice at Western University out in California. Um, and what they did was look at the guesses made by uh, more than 900 professionals within our field. So when we say professionals, we mean uh, vet techs, shelter workers, um, vet veterinarians, um, lots of different people working within the sheltering field. Uh, I think that, can you guys, everybody hear me okay? I'm sorry about that. Um, so Kristen, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you are fading in and out a bit. Oh, no. All right. Um, sorry, everyone. So what Dr. Voice study found um, of, the, of those 923 people polled 
was that when we guessed at the breeds of dogs that were made available to us, and these were shelter dogs of unknown heritage, unknown history, um, our guesses were wrong 50, at least 50% of the time, and typically much more like 75% of the time. So that was the first generation of that research. There was a follow-up study done. Can I ask you a question about that? So they, so yeah. no, so the people didn't agree. Like when the same people were looking at the same dog, or when different people were looking at the same dog, they weren't agreeing with each other. Is that right? Well, that's the like second what's study the that I'm going to talk about right now. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so in the first study, it was just looking at those guesses and, and looking at how accurate they were as compared to DNA results. So compared to those DNA results, we were wrong within our field um, between – 50% of the time and much much closer to 75% of the time with most of those guesses. So there was a second study that looked at that same data to look at how we were agreeing with each other. And the reason that that's important is because it sort of points to this issue of not necessarily being something that we need more training on, but something that we needed to change our systems around. So there was very little agreement between those guesses, which means that, um, Kristen, say you looked at the, a picture of a dog and guessed that it was a um, Border Collie Lab mix, I would perhaps have looked at the same picture of a dog and guessed that it was a Pitbull Aussie mix. So there was, there was very little, if any, agreement between the guesses um, of those professionals. Does that make sense? Yes. Awesome. So there was a couple more uh, studies that sort of backed up this same line of thinking. There was one uh, done at University of Florida that looked specifically at the way that we were breed labeling pit bull dogs um, and found that there was really inconsistent identification of the dogs that we were calling pit bulls, which I think makes sense based on what we're all experiencing within our own shelters. There was another um, article in the Journal of Veterinary Medical Association that Saw, uh, that really concluded that photos were the best way to identify um, client dogs even because there was so little agreement on uh, breed labels. And finally, there was a more recent study um, in 2016 that really concluded that breed labels on kennel cards actually negatively impacted the length of stay and outcomes for all of the dogs um, within a shelter environment. So this is really just a, a smattering of information for you all to see that um, it's, not, it's not just the dry, boring sort of genetic science piece of things. It definitely uh, coincides with the way that it is affecting our work in the shelter environment. So again, these are just some things for us to call to mind as we start to dive into the information that really takes us beyond the research um, and into how we can start to apply this information um, in, in our real lives, in our shelters. One thing that um, Kristen and I didn't mention when we started was that we gave this presentation um, just earlier in 2016 at the HSUS conference. And that was less than a year ago. And at the time, our, our whole presentation sort of had a different um, a different tone, and we were really trying to sell, sell people on this idea of removing breed labels, and we had to focus a lot more on this research end of things and, and why we needed to remove those labels. But what has happened in less than a year is that so many more uh, shelter software systems have really started to change and started to adjust um, what they're offering to us in terms of being able to apply labels like mixed breed or unknown. Um, and that's really changed the game. So this is all important information for us to have in terms of um, just knowing our facts, you know, and, and knowing some of the background research. And again, it's things that you can dive into a little bit deeper. But I think the most important part of this conversation now becomes how do we apply this to everyday life in the shelter? Yeah, if you haven't... Um there's going to be a link to the um, new ebook that just came out from Animal Farm Foundation, and all the research that Caitlin just referenced. Links to all of that are contained within the ebook. The ebook's really helpful if you're a shelter or a rescue that's already decided you want to make the change. 
um, to removing breed labels or using a mixed breed label. Uh, the ebook's really helpful to give to your volunteers and staff, and we'll talk a little bit more about that process of transition um, to give them all of this information um, that backs up uh, changing how we how we're describing dogs in our in our shelters and rescues. Um, one of the things that uh, gets lost sometimes is that most people, so most of us in sheltering, know that breed labels can be really harmful to some of our dogs, particularly for medium and large dogs, breed labels can, can um, increase length of stay um, regardless of what breed it is. And we also often think of the stereotypes that go along with certain breeds. So we imagine that um, dogs that call, get called hounds, people are going to um, assume that that dog is going to be loud and not house trained um, and uh, might have stereotypes associated with it. But what we don't always think of is that when we breed label, there's also generalizations. And some of those generalizations may be really positive, but when those don't hold up as true uh, for that particular dog, um, we sometimes see dogs getting returned. So for instance, someone may adopt something called a lab that is arbitrarily lab labeled a lab in a shelter, and they expect that dog to go fetch a ball and to love all children. And when that dog doesn't meet up to those positive generalizations, those uh, false expectations caused by this arbitrary label that may or may not reflect reality, um, that dog loses out. Um, and so the, this has real consequences for the dogs. And so many of us working in this field already know that. Um, and so it, it, begs, it begs a big question, um, which is, why are we still guessing? Why are we still doing this? Um, and and I, I think there's a lot of a lot of different answers to that question. I think I think that um, in a lot of cases there have been uh, m problems specific to the technology that we're using, whether it is um, shelter software or some of the ways that we're we're advertising our animals. There are still so a couple of barriers left to um, to overcome. But I think that by and large, this is again one of those areas where we're seeing so much progress. And I think, and at least our hope is, that once we sort of present you with um, a bit of a roadmap to, to overcome those barriers and to let go of some of our fear of, you know, what is the public going to think and how are we going to um, make this change in our own community, I think that the road forward for most of us is a lot smoother than, than we assumed that it would be. And so this is just our, our last um, sort of reminder. Because we, we did show you a lot of information um, that comes from an organization like Animal Farm, which does you know, serve a, a mission specific to pit bull dogs, but it's really important, as Kristen was saying, that that labels affect all of the dogs in our care, and sometimes in, in various ways. As Kristen was saying, sometimes some of those positive um, sort of stereotypes can take us in the wrong direction. Um, so it, it's just an important sort of um, tap on the shoulder to give ourselves that we're not necessarily serving the dogs in our care to the best of our ability if we are simply relying on stereotypes and not trying to collect more information about them while they're in our care. Yes, I have as a brief aside, um, I, we, I learned this lesson the hard way uh, a couple of years ago. We had a husky in our shelter um, who was a dog that would, was really good at escaping uh, his kennel. And he would escape at night and go, he would sit on our um, administrative assistant's chair um, and we'd find his little paw prints in the morning. And, um, and so we, we advertised him on social media and we said, this is a husky and he needs a husky savvy owner um, to adopt him. And quite promptly, um, one, of the, uh, one of the directors at Animal Farm Foundation chimed into social media and said, well, does the, is the Husky's new owner required to have a sled and be able to say mush? And at, at the time, I felt really embarrassed um, because I realized that even though we had taken the step to get rid of um, breed labels um, for so many reasons, I had kind of fallen back into this old pattern of breed, giving, assigning a breed label to this dog um, and, then assign, and then myself assigning attributes to the dog based on that. So what we did instead is that we went back and read that dog's notes and we found out that he um, loves cats. 
Uh, he had lived with cats in his previous home. And so we found a cat in the shelter who, all, who had been reported to live with dogs and love dogs. And um, we put them together and they became best friends. And, and then we decided to market them on their personalities and the fact that they really liked um, members of the other species, um, at least in the shelter and in their <laughs> previous home. And uh, that is a, it's an example of how labels, even though we sort of think about them impacting certain dogs more than others, um, they're actually impacting not just the dog, not, not the dogs in obvious ways, but they're impacting the whole culture of our organization. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about how this all has played out in the real world and what's been happening the last several years, uh, because a lot of changes have happened. So, filter software system. When we gave this presentation um, last year, we gave it uh, several different places. Um, one of those was at the Texas Unites conference, and we were really surprised at a conference. Texas is a very challenged state. Um, Many of the communities have intakes of 40 to 50 to 60,000 animals and above, um, and it's faced with massive problems. And we were really surprised that at this uh, last year, um, our, the room was packed. It was standing room only for this presentation about breed labeling. And we were really surprised that that issue would be of interest to people who are facing such serious um, things in their communities. But what we found and what we also found presenting this at Expo is that this, this issue of breed labeling is tied to so many of the other challenges that we're facing um, and the ways that we are describing our dogs um, truly, truly have life and death consequences. So when we started talking about this and in 2013, we were plagued by this problem that shelter software systems were requir requiring us to choose a primary breed identifier. So many of you are familiar with this, um, and I'm going to take, I'm going to pause for a minute to ask you, um, this is a, a, what we call a pulse check here on the webcast, but um, I'm going to ask you to give me a thumbs up if you are still working for an organization or volunteering for an organization that is breed labeling, and a thumbs down if you are working for an organization that is not breed labeling on your kennel cards or your shelter software. So if your organization is still using breed labels, give me a thumbs up. And if your organization isn't, give me a thumbs down. And we'll pause just for a minute to give people time to respond. Okay, so of the, about half the people who are watching have responded and um, 50, it looks like 112 uh, shelters, rescue organizations are still using breed labels. Um, 100, we're up to 124, and we have 13 that say they are not. So that's great. That's what we're here for. Um, so we have. Great. So we're gonna end that one. And I want to ask one more question: How many of you that are using um, that are currently breed labeling are considering making the change to either removing breed labels or starting to use a mixed breed or unknown breed label. Um, give me a thumbs up if you are considering making that change in your organization at this time and a thumbs down if you're not currently considering making that change in your organization. And we'll give just a minute for people to answer. This is, another, this is a good time to remind everyone, if you do have questions, we're going to be going through some question and answer. But if you do have questions, submit them early so that we can be sure to get them. We're going to save some time at the end to answer your, your specific questions. Um, and it looks like of those of you who responded uh, so far to this, this pulse check, uh, 74 of your organizations are considering making the change right now, and we have 30 that are not yet considering that. So uh, good, there's a lot of possibility uh, tonight, so we'll do our best to, uh, to convince you over this <laughs> next, uh, next half hour or so. Absolutely. Right, so I would just add system. to what Kristen was saying to say, um, not only, you know, were there challenges um, that were coming up that were tied to other issues, there's also lots of solutions that are coming up that are tied to this issue. So when Kristen referred to um, owner, owner surrender and, and intake forms and really having that be a valuable place to get information on that husky dog, that, that's one of the, the solutions that we'll look towards. And, and you'll really see by the end of this presentation that so much of what we're doing in all of our shelters is tied to this issue um, in one way or another. Yes. 
All right, see, so some of you may recognize this. This is kind of the kennel, the type of kennel listing we see online still, and you can see the primary breed is identified. Um, and, and probably you can see at least one animal on here that you might disagree with how that animal is labeled. Um, because we know that when, uh, as animal welfare professionals, when we guess, we don't agree with each other. But this is what you often see still on, in, on online listings. Um, and up until very recently, that was the only option, uh, was to have a primary breed identifier. Um, during this time, Animal Farm Foundation came out with this great resource. And at one point, um, at my time in Fairfax County, Virginia, we had these on every single one of our kennels. And if you're still in a place where you're not able to consider a change or you're in a community that does have breed-specific legislation and um, you, are, you are required to use breed identifiers, this is a great card to use. It just says the shelter software system requires that we choose a predominant breed or breed mix for our dogs. For our dogs, visual breed identification in dogs is unreliable. So for most of our dogs, we're only guessing at predominant breed or breed mix. We encourage you to select your new companion by considering each dog's individual personality and pet qualities instead of relying on a breed label that is only a guess. These cards are still, um, or a version of these cards are still available um, at animalfarmfoundation.org, uh, which is Animal Farm Foundation's website, um, along with a whole bunch of other great resources. So if you're, so this is what, this was sort of a stopgap, a first step to we, saying we have to use these breed labels, um, but this is uh, what you need to know, that they're really just guesses. Well, things have changed, um, and quite rapidly. I remember in uh, 2013 having this conversation, and we all sat around the room feeling really frustrated, thinking that um, shelter software companies were not going to change, and they were not going to give us the option to use mixed breed or unknown. Um, that's what we were asking for. We, what we were arguing at the time was that was to say that the shelter software company should not be dictating that we have to give dogs a primary breed identifier because we know there are so many dogs that we look at and we just have no idea. There's probably 10 different um, unique, distinct breeds in many of them. Um, and so we, we really didn't think a change was possible, but what we did is we started conversations with the companies and over a period of several years, um, the company is engaged with us because many of the shelter software companies really understood um, as they saw the research coming out that these arbitrary labels were inaccurate and also causing really big problems for, for dogs. And in, some, in many cases, um, they, were, they were hurting the chances of survival for some of the animals to get out of the shelter. So things have changed now. Uh, currently, Shelter Love, uh, one of the shelter software systems, doesn't require breed labels, um, and it does offer mixed breed um, based on size. So you can give a primary um, label of mixed breed to any dog in your system, and that goes online as well as on the kennel cards. That's also true for um, PetPoint, uh, which is a company owned by Pet Health. They now, um, as of November of 2016, um, following a whole series of conversations with shelter professionals, did decide to add a mixed breed option as a primary breed identifier. So, you, so now um, a kennel card can read uh, mixed mixed instead of the old way it had to have a primary breed, so it would have said lab mix. Now, now it can say mixed mixed as the breed identifier. Uh, animal shelter manager lets shelters add their own breed names to the breed drop down men menu. And Chameleon and Shelter Buddy both, um, upon request, will work with shelters to have mixed breed used um, as an option uh, on the shelter software. So things have changed really rapidly and that's created uh, a lot of, uh, that's made things a lot easier for shelters. So if you're currently using one of those systems that does allow it, um, Shelter Love and Pet Point, it's both automatic. Those other systems, you, you should go ahead and contact them and uh, let them know that you'd like that option. Uh, <clears throat> This is really exciting for us to see. This is a kennel. This is the first kennel card that uh, that I saw from. This is from Williamson County Animal Shelter um, in Williamson County, Texas, which is just the county north of uh, Travis County, where Austin is. Uh, and this is a Pet Point kennel card, and you'll see that there is no breed label on it. So this is a dog that's clearly of mixed breed heritage, and now can be labeled as that, as a mixed breed dog. That was a really exciting moment when we finally saw that change. Well, 
So now we have these options. A lot of the barriers um, are removed, and the question comes in, okay, so now we can do it. Now we're, we're able to make these changes in our shelter software system. We're able to stop using primary breed identifiers, which many of us weren't before. So how do we actually do it? What happens when you decide you want to make that change in your organization? I'm going to go through now, and Caitlin, feel free to jump in at any point. I'm going to go through now some of the questions that have come up. Caitlin and I have presented this numerous times um, for a number of national and regional audiences, and some, some questions come up over and over again, and so we're going to go through those, and this is a good time, too, if you have follow-up questions from those. Um, to send those questions to us so that we can answer them during the webcast period. One of the big ones we get is once you take the breed labels off of the kennels, uh, once you take them off of your shelter software system and your, your adoptable available pets listing doesn't have breed labels, doesn't the public continue to guess? Well, the answer is yeah, they do. Uh, the public does guess. And just like us, uh, four members of the public walk through our shelter, and they will give us four different guesses to what most of our dogs are. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. Uh, this is a one, one more pulse check. Have any of you ever had the experience of one or, or two or more people looking at the same dog and not agreeing on what the breed was or the breed mix, where two or more people don't agree? Um, give us a thumbs up if you have had this experience, and a thumbs down if you have not had this experience. And we'll give just a minute for people to answer this. If you've had that experience where two people or three people have looked at the same dog and thought, given, called it different things, and, um, and not agreed on what the same dog is. Okay, so out of 128 of you who've responded, uh, 127, 127 have said, yes, you have had this experience, and only two of you have said that you haven't. And this is definitely what we find um, when we ask audiences this. Pretty much everyone raises their hand, and this is true of the public, too. People do guess at breeds, and that can be a really fun game for people. And a lot of our adopters, they take home their new dog, and, and they do. They get a DNA test, and they find it really exciting to know the unique concoction of uh, breeds that make up their, their dogs. Um, and so we're happy when the public does that. That's fine, and it's a fun part of picking out a new pet, but um, that isn't where the conversation ends for us. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Caitlin, do you have anything to add to that? I think it's, I, uh, I think it's just important to remember that even when, even when we are putting breed labels on our kennel cards, and now we're starting to understand sort of, sort of the pitfalls of that, um, the public is still still making those guesses. <laughs> I, I've walked through um, a lot of shelters when we've been working with them or visiting um, alongside the public and had them look at the, the kennel cards and say, oh, the shelter called this dog a such and such mix, but I don't see that. I see blah, blah, blah. So I think it is important to remember that there's there's already a little bit of that happening. Um, it's just that they're actively disagreeing with the breed label that we have put out there on the kennel card. Um, and so removing that sort of sort of removes a little bit of the tension from the conversations that come after that. Oh, that's a really good point. Um, okay, so next question we get all the time is, well, what do you do when people do ask, what breed is that? That's a question that is going to come up. This is one of my very favorite, like the one of the most adorable dogs that um, I've seen in any of the shelters I've worked in. Um, <laughs> And so certainly people would ask us, what the heck breed is that? Well, we do get that question, um, and we do have a really uh, specific answer to it, and it's something that we tr have trained our staff and volunteers also to answer, and um, it's the answer that we feel is the most honest, and it's simply that we don't know, um, and that the vast majority of dogs that do come into our shelter of mixed breed heritage. And then we follow that up by saying, but what kind of personality are you looking for in a dog? What, t tell us a little bit about your lifestyle. So we use that question to start a, a, a bigger conversation. Um, and <clears throat> the, the, another secondary question that comes up a lot when we, when we talk about this is people say, well, what if 
you have a dog in your shelter, but it actually looks like a purebred dog. You're almost certain that it is. So uh, a miniature pincher that looks just like what you imagine a miniature pincher is. Well, that's ultimately the decision of a shelter. And, and certainly, even if you have a mixed breed um, option, you don't have to use it for every dog. If you have um, a pedigree on a dog and you know that it's an old English sheep dog um, and, and that it is from a closed gene pool from that pedigree, then by all means label it. The idea is to be more honest with our um, adopters and to give them the best information possible. Um, and so you can always, if you do, if you do have reason to believe that an animal is truly a purebred, um, you can always go ahead and use that label. Or if a dog looks like what you think it, it what if a dog looks like a, a quote unquote purebred dog, and you want to label it, but you don't have those um, those pedigree papers, you can always say unknown, um, but looks like X. Um, and the, the, another thing that comes up when we talk about this is what about DNA testing? Well, what, why don't we just really find out about all the dogs in our care so that we can tell people exactly what they are? And Caitlin, I think you speak to this a little bit uh, more clearly than, than, I, uh, than I can. So can you talk a little bit about DNA testing? Sure. And, and this is probably absolutely one of the more common questions that I think Kristen and I both get. Um, and I think there are a couple of schools of thought on this. Um, but but I think the thing to remember is, um, A, DNA tests are at the moment a little bit cost prohibitive for shelters um, to be DNA testing every single dog that comes into their care. And so if your shelter has the resources to, to do that and, and wants to place uh, the monetary resources in that direction, I think that that's, that's one hurdle to overcome. Um, the second piece is even if you are able to do that or if you get funding to do it or if the cost uh, come down on those tests. I think it's really important to remember that even when we get those DNA tests back um, and they show us a couple of generations of uh, mixed breed dogs and maybe there's a couple of purebreds in there and you get percentages and it starts to feel like, you know, the puzzle pieces are really coming together. Um, it's really important to remember that we still don't know where those pure breeds are expressing in this mixed breed dog standing in front of us. And what I mean by that is um, if you get back DNA results that a dog is 25% this and 35% that, um, we still it doesn't give us the information that we really need and that is most valuable to answer the questions um, that are most pertinent to matchmaking and adoption. So I don't know if this dog is going to act like the dog that I think is 25% in there. Um, and, and ultimately, those sort of stereotypes about breeds are what start to lead us down a path of being less and less accurate. Um, rather, we are sort of suggesting in the sake, for the sake of accuracy, you share that DNA results if you have it, um, but that you also still help that adopter understand that it doesn't mean that we can predict everything about this dog's future, and we, and we certainly can't predict its behavior based on that DNA test result. Um, so it's still always yes. going to come back to the programs in our shelters that are helping us get to know the animal better. All right, thank you. All right, so we've got three more questions we're going to talk about, and these are the big, these are what we call like the big three. These are the ones that really like are <laughs> sticking points for people. So. Uh, I, I'm going to do a pulse check. How many of you feel like housing restrictions are one of the top three greatest challenges to life-saving that you're facing currently in your rescue, your community, or your shelter? How many of you feel like housing restrictions, apartments, HOAs, one of the top three challenges you're facing um, in your community or your animal shelter, your rescue? A thumbs up if you do believe that it's one of the, they're one of the top three a thumbs down if you do not believe those are one of the top three challenges you're facing. And we're giving people just a minute to answer. If you have questions, this is a good time to submit them so we can get to them during the podcast. Uh, wow. Okay. So we're seeing um, a lot of you are answering this, this one. Um, and very quickly, uh, of, of everyone who's answered so far, uh, 100 and, about 120 have said yes. You feel like it, that housing restrictions are one of the top um, three challenges facing your community, and about 22 have said they're not. So the vast majority of us are really feeling the pressure. And 
what we we've say what we've been saying lately as we talk about saving the vast majority of animals in our, in our care is that no matter how well we do our jobs, no matter uh, what we do to save animals, these restrictions um, are are making it almost impossible to get the animals rehomed. So we're saving them, but it's becoming harder and harder uh, for people to adopt them. And I know in our organization, we have probably 10 adopters a day who come in and they say, you know, I would love to take this pet home, but we're not allowed to have those um, it, where I live. And it's really heartbreaking. And, and on the other side, on the intake side, about a third of our intake now of medium and large dogs is because of housing restrictions. People move or they just can't afford the ever um, the ever growing pet fees that are being charged, monthly fees, one-time fees that are really cost prohibitive. So this is a huge problem and it's probably going to be a fight we're having over the next 10 years. But here's why it's important to this conversation. Um, this is a this is from Zillow for Pros. So Zillow is like a this is Zillow for Pros is a site um, for like landlords and people who do rentals. Um, and I won't bore you with all the details, but as you read this, some of you are probably like laughing, like what what is this? Um, Zillow gives this very long list of uh, breeds that it believes can be problematic in housing, um, and this is where people are getting their information. It's completely it's of course just like all breed restriction lists arbitrary um, and not based on any reality at all. Um, this list includes breeds of all sizes and increasingly we're seeing um, it is the lists are ever expanding but we're seeing more and more restrictions based on size and the sizes are getting smaller and smaller, um, pets under 20 pounds only. Uh, and so this is becoming a huge issue um, and interestingly in Zillow's um, Zillow has all this information about breeds that may be problematic, but they also say that, unfortunately, there's no way to um, characterize a mutt. And we found that really telling because what we're doing when we assign inaccurate arbitrary breed labels in shelters, we, give, we, we, we take these dogs in front of us. We know we're not accurately describing um, any genetic reality. We give them these breed labels. We're playing right into the hands of the landlords, of the people who are trying to restrict our family members, our companions, um, and we're actually, we're actually helping them uh, restrict and discriminate against certain dogs. And so this is a really profound reason why if for no other reason you think mixed breed labeling is a good idea or you want to try it, this is a good reason to try it um, because we stop playing this game that's allowing the discrimination um, against certain sizes, types, breeds, um, looks of, of dogs going into housing. Um, and so we need to be aware of this because this is where people are getting their information. And so it's up to all of us in the, our communities to be talking to landlords, to be finding those examples of housing where, they, where they're not discriminating based on breed, um, and to be uh, working on this issue because we're going to need to be. It's, it's increasingly causing problems uh, for all of us. Okay, so another big one. What about lost pets? What about lost pets? Because people search by breed, and, um, and so aren't we going to harm people? Aren't we going to have fewer matches made when people are looking for their pets online and, and all the pets are listed as mixed breed? And this, in a community like ours, is a real concern. We have, as I said, up to 1,400 animals in our system at any time. Well, uh, we went on Pet Finder, and it took us about 10 seconds to find this picture of Elton. Um, Elton is, uh, he's a, he was a dog on Pet Finder, and he is listed as a purebred dog. So look at Elton for a minute. And if you were looking at him, what breed would you guess that Elton is? Uh, what, what guess would you make? Some people may say Chow. Some people say Shepherd mix. Well, Elton is listed as a Golden Retriever. And this is true um, all over. It takes you about 10 seconds to find one of these. In, in 10 minutes, you can find 15 dogs that you that really their labels don't seem to match what we, we for most of us, would think of when we look at that dog. Um, and that's a problem for people who are looking for their lost pets. There was recently a case in Houston called the Lyra case where an owner was looking for their Belgian Malinois and um, the shelter had it listed as a German Shepherd or, or maybe it was vice versa. And the owner didn't find the animal 
because they were looking under the wrong breed. And many of us have had this experience um, that people are not finding their pets because they're uh, looking for it based on breed. The really easy solution to this is to put a banner at the top of your found pet listings that says don't search for dogs based on breed. Look at photos, come into the shelter. Breed is not an accurate identifier. Um, we should all be doing that on the top of our shelter software systems. Um, and the last question, doesn't this impact breed rescues? This one is really concerning many of our, our organizations, um, particularly in high volume communities or in under-resourced um, shelters and communities uh, are relying on breed rescues to come and pull those, those dogs that appear to be purebreds out. And then the question comes up, well, well how will the breed rescues find the dogs um, that, that would match what they're looking for? And um, we've done this now. Um, I've, I've been in two communities where we've made this switch. Uh, and I will tell you that we've seen no decrease in um, the purebred rescues finding the dogs that they believe will fit their organization appropriately or fit the breed they're looking for. Um, and, and, and they're searching by photograph. Um, and they are finding those dogs uh, that, that they would pull based on the visual breed identification. Um, and w as we're talking to other communities who've made this change, they're also not seeing any impact. They're still finding those more high... Um, quote unquote, highly desirable um, purebred looking dogs, uh, they're still finding them and pulling them from the shelter. So we haven't seen an impact on uh, dogs going to breed rescue based on this. Um, so those are just a few of the questions. Um, yes. Oh, sorry, Kristen. I just wanted to, to add um, as coming from working in an organization that was. Um, you know, pulling dogs into our rescue that that were fitting, you know, some sort of pit bull label, what, whatever form that took, and that that's a very broad range. I think that we also found that was a really good opportunity, even with our our breed rescue, so to speak, was to a good opportunity for education and to start to talk to our adopters about why we were um, not necessarily breed labeling the dogs that we were taking in and, and using that as an education checkpoint to talk about the wide array of animals that get that get the pit bull label and, and how we can sort of overcome a lot of the stereotypes that also come along with that. Mm, that's a really good point. Okay, so really quickly, how do you do this? How do you make this change? And is it as simple as just using mixed breed or taking the labels off your kennel cards? Um, it's not that simple, but in a way it's a lot easier because um, we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we did in Fairfax County because we really made a larger cultural shift. Um, we not only removed breed labels from our kennel cards at the time that I was working in Fairfax, we didn't have the option to use mixed breeds, so we couldn't remove them from our shelter software system yet, um, but we did take them from our kennel cards. We stopped using breed labels in social media posts. And that forced us to be much more creative about how we describe the dogs in our care. And it forced us to get to know the dogs in front of us rather than relying on these arbitrary labels. And I'll give an example of that in just a minute. Um, we, we had to change how we talked about breed internally and we had to constantly challenge each other. For those of you in leadership positions um, in shelters or rescues, it's really important to be having these conversations um, and to be challenging each other all the time. I used the Husky example a little while ago, but um, another quick example is after we made the switch, I remember hearing one of our staff members talking, um, I heard her talking to a potential adopter uh, about cattle dogs, and she was saying cattle dogs are some of the hardest dogs, and they, they require special owners because they need to be working dogs, and they need to go to working homes, and they, more of them get euthanized in our care than any other dog. And this was her perception. This did not match reality at all. Um, she was a sort of a, um, a fisting auto of, um, of cattle dogs and, and cared about um, that, that breed. But we had a conversation after that and, said, and we talked about why that was problematic um, and why uh, it, breed labeling any dog and then sort of assigning characteristics to, that, to it based on that um, is really a problem because that, her conversation with that person stopped an adoption of a, of a mixed breed dog that she identified as a, a cattle dog and also left that adopter walking out with those stereotypes in mind and believing those. Um, so we really had to have hard conversations with staff and volunteers. And still, as part of all of our ongoing, um, now I'm in Austin, Texas, and as part of our um, volunteer onboarding and our um, staff training, we're constantly talking about this 
and why we use other ways of identifying the dogs for other than um, breed labeling them. Um, back then, we, we requested our shelter software system allow us to use mixed breed as an identifier, um, and we role played with staff and volunteers on what to do when someone says, what breed is that? Uh, many of our organizations have awesome customer service. People really want to help. And so I think one of the hardest times is when an adopter asks that, or a potential adopter asks that question, people want to be helpful, and so they tend to give the answer even if they know we're not breed labeling. And so we've, we role play with our staff and volunteers about how to answer that question and how to explain that the vast majority of dogs in our care of mixed breed um, origin. So um, a quick example, that's Dalton. Dalton was this dog that was in our care, um, and he was like, first marketed, this is when we were making the switch in Fairfax, he was first marketed as like a young, like a two-year-old male pit bull um, with happy tail who was barrier reactive. Um, and we, as we made the switch, Dalton was just kind of sitting in our shelter and he, he would bark at other dogs as they went by and he had a, uh, what, you know, what we call a happy tail, which means he wagged his tail so much that he had like, there was blood on his kennel. So not a like not an easy dog to get out of your shelter so as part of this organizational change um, one of our volunteers offered to take him home to see how he acted outside of the shelter to give him a break um, and so we knew we needed to get to know him better because we couldn't we weren't breed labeling we had to figure out we had to learn about this dog so she took him home um, and the quick story is that she took him on a walk every day um, and on the on the third day, um, he at the time that she typically took him on a walk, um, he he went to the closet and out of a number of coats in the closet, he picked her coat out, um, and uh, and he held it in his mouth waiting for her to take him on a walk. Well, we we instead of marketing Dalton the way we had, we just simply told the story about him. We brought him back to the shelter and. Uh, that same day, we had six people lined up to adopt Dalton, um, who immediately went home and went on to live a um, fantastic life with his family. But it, it really brings us to like the larger point that removing breed labels is tied to many other organizational changes that are related to getting rid of treating every dog as if they're the same and we're just moving them through this factory system to really getting to know the dogs in front of us. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit um, in a moment about how we do that in an organization where we have hundreds of dogs in our care because that can be really challenging. Um, but we're doing it and we're seeing increases in adoption. This past year, uh, we were up uh, about 600 adoptions um, for the previous year. Um, so we are seeing a measurable increase in adoptions as we are getting rid of the breed labels um, and treating each dog as, as individuals. So this um, this quote is from uh, from a friend of ours who did a presentation with us uh, on this topic, and she works at a shelter in Michigan. And um, before they made the change to remove breed labels, there was a lot of anxiety, I think, within her organization about all the questions that Kristen sort of just covered, um, and especially that that issue of you know how do we answer questions from the public and how do we um, how do we prepare internally to make this switch? Um, so I, I love that in the process of making this change, they really found this amazing silver lining in that not only were they starting to get to know their dogs better and sort of pay more attention to those interactions that they were having um, in order to, to get more accurate information and rely less on those breed labels, but they also found that they were getting to know their adopters better because they switched in the process and, and very much related to what Kristen is referring to um, of, of changing some of the other policies and the ways that we do things within our shelters, they found that they were switching to a more conversational style of uh, getting to know their adopters and also conversing about the dogs in their care. And, and so I think that that's an important thing for us to all um, sort of keep in the back of our minds that it's an uncomfortable thing to sometimes have to say, uh, we don't know, especially when, when you have someone standing in front of you saying, you know, what kind of dog is this? Because I want to take it home, but I want to know what kind of dog it is. And we're so invested in, in life-saving and sending these animals home. That can be a, a high-pressure moment. But I think it's important to remember that um, saying, I don't know, doesn't mean it's the end of the conversation. It's really just the beginning of the conversation. 
So we're going to um, sort of take the next step and talk about um, what to, where to invest our time a little bit more effectively um, once we're, we're removing breed labels. So again, this is another really beautiful quote from our friends at uh, Capital Area Humane Society. And this sort of speaks to what I was saying about their anxiety beforehand. They had several meetings and staff training sessions to prepare. Um, and everyone was very worried about, you know, what are we going to say and how are we going to say it? And that's a really good place to be because when we're having those conversations, I think um, we're preparing ourselves effectively to uh, engage, as Kristen said, role playing, lots of different exercises to undertake so that we feel confident and prepared to have those conversations. Um, and, and what they found, though, was that after all of that anxiety and all of that worry, there weren't a lot of questions. Um, and I think it's important to remember we're, we're often in our bubble in animal welfare um, and in our shelters because we have our heads down and we're working really hard on the day-to-day -day operations. But many people are walking into our shelters for the very first time. And so it's, it's not often that you get someone that was there maybe last week and said, oh, there were, there were breed labels on the kennel cards last week. What did you do with them? Um, that's not a, a common situation, but I feel like it's something that we do worry a fair amount about. Um, so Can again, I say something a, a about that really three. quick? Yeah. Can I say something about it? Literally no one in any, either shelter where we've removed breed labels has ever asked us, where's the breed label? Like that's never once happened. Um, people really don't yeah. know. I just wanted to exactly. affirm what you're saying. Yeah, and it's sort of one of those moments. Um, I, I thought of this of the same thing when Kristen mentioned Happy Tail, where we get so into our bubble where we're using language that is only really insider speak, and we're, we're really um, conditioned to our everyday life, but it's not necessarily the everyday um, experience of our adopters. And so I, I love that they sort of prepared and were ready but that they didn't need to worry as much as they did. Um, one of the things, and this is, you know, these are topics that uh, there are certainly full webinars on some of these kinds of things, but Kristen and I are, are really big proponents of, especially in shelters where you have a large population of dogs, of investing time differently. Um, and, and you may say to yourself, well, we're not spending a ton of time when an animal comes in guessing at their breed. But, but that time adds up through, throughout the day and, and throughout the weeks and months. And so there are better ways for us to get to know our, the animals in our care much more quickly, um, things like playgroup enrichment programs, um, really bulking up our volunteer programs and our marketing programs. Um, Kristen, what, what have you guys done at Austin uh, Animal Center to sort of overcome that barrier? Well, we'll talk, I'm going to talk in a minute about the report card because I think that's uh, one of our ways to, uh, along with playgroups and daily kennel enrichment, that's our way to kind of describe the dogs that are in our care. And um, the only other thing I'll mention is that we send about half of our animals to foster, um, including many of our adult dogs, which helps us get, um, get to know them much, much more quickly. About half our animals go into foster um, to help us get to know them and get them out of the shelter more quickly. And is that long-term foster or foster outings? Uh, anywhere from an hour to all the way until the pet's adopted. We don't care. We want every dog, every cat to get a break from the shelter, whatever that means, and it gives us great marketing material, and we don't need to rely on the breed label because we know so much. One hour out of the shelter teaches us so much more about a dog than a week in the kennel. Awesome. Very cool. So very quickly, um, as, as was mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I'm with an organization called HeartSpeak, and so our whole mission in life is to really um, look at the marketing end of things, which is very much related to, um, to what we're talking about now, is when we're spending less time with free labels and, and eliminating some of those barriers, where we can start to invest better time is using um, our bios and our photos to tell a bit of, uh, of a story, especially when we're collecting more information about the individual animals in our care. Um, so I just wanted to give you a couple of examples that I really love, um, specifically from this organization, Orange County Animal Services. Um, and what I loved about when they made uh, their change, which was actually, they were one of the first shelters to decide to remove these labels, is that they really made a celebration of it. Um, they put out a press release. They were very transparent and straightforward about this change. 
And that's not a choice that every shelter needs to make, but I think um, they are really sort of leading the way in terms of not only making this change, but being very, very uh, proud about it. And I also just wanted to give you a quick um, peek at what they did instead of sort of investing time in breed labeling was to take better photos of the animals in their care and also put that directly on their website. This was all pre-changes um, to shelter software systems. And so they really did a great job of just putting out there a really good image of their shelter and the animals in their care through these photographs. Um, and just identifying animals by their, their ID numbers and their names um, and, and really investing time more, um, more in that direction. So since then, countless shelters, so many shelters, we're, we're losing count, have decided to remove breed labels. And across the board, they're telling us that the change is a positive one for their organization. Um, after the study came out that showed that breed labels actually um, negatively impact length of stay for all dogs, um, numerous shelters decided to change how they were marketing to take the labels off the kennel card. So here's just a couple examples. Um, people got creative. They started making their own kennel cards. Um, here's uh, Dallas Animal Services. Um, <clears throat> All these organizations were, this is Washington Humane Society, which is now Humane Rescue Alliance. Um, prior to the change, they figured out a software workaround to, to take off breed labels, and, and they were calling their dogs dogs um, without using those breed labels. So uh, that was, the, now we're up to um, dozens and dozens of shelters that have made the change. And really quickly, um, just another place for us to invest some of that, that marketing time is in the way that uh, we are writing about the animals in our care. So photos are sort of like the, the cover of the book that we want to be um, showing to the public about that animal. Um, and the bio is where we really can get into sort of the synopsis or that, that back cover of the book where we can give a really good um, at what they can find when they come to the shelter. And I know for me, one of the toughest parts um, is being constantly creative and, and trying to come up with words beyond cute and adorable. And, and I start to hear myself being sort of a broken record in that way. And it also starts to lose some of its meaning. Um, after a while, the same words on a lot of different bios makes it sound like we don't really know the animals in our care that well. So this is just a, a slide that I hope you can refer to in the future of um, some adjectives and some, some words that can sort of spice up the bio writing game. Uh, another really effective tactic, I think, when we're, we're trying to get a little bit more creative, and this is a fun thing to do if you're able to write bios with another person. Um, is to start to think about the interview questions that you would ask that animal. And a great place for inspiration there is um, magazine articles where, where they're interviewing celebrities. You can get a lot of really great questions from there. Um, one of my favorites is uh, my favorite place to be is a lap, your heart, by a pair of feet under a desk. Um, I think the other thing that we can get a little bit more creative is um, the way that we advertise animals of all different ages. So when I grow up, I'd like to be anything, 10 is the new two. So putting a really positive spin on um, some of the stories that we tell about the animals in our care, I think can be a really effective way to do that. Kristen, um, did you have something you wanted to add about bios? Yes. Um, let's go to uh, our, if we can, oh, I want to go skip to this kennel card. So in our organization, we have like 300 to 500 or more dogs available for adoption at any time. So writing bio sounds nice. Um, for a lot of our long stay dogs, we have volunteers that do that. But in reality, we just have too many dogs to write bios about um, <clears throat> every single one. And so we came up with this idea, um, and actually you can, you can download a, a printable version, steal this from us please, um, from Animal Farm Foundation. Um, this is a, a simple report card that we put on every kennel. It's laminated. Um, and our volunteers actually work with the dogs to teach them these things. So we, they learn basic obedience skills, 
all of our dogs are eligible to go on outings with volunteers whenever they want. Um, and they also go to play groups. So we're able to just have volunteers simply circle what the, what the dog does. So a volunteer takes the dog swimming, they'll circle that category. Um, it teaches it fetch. The, the volunteer teaches the dog fetch. They'll circle that category. And then we have a few qualities listed. And this is kind of our answer to high volume describing the dogs differently um, rather than using a, a breed label. This is sort of the information that adopters want to know about our dogs. So that's how we get around that, that issue. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. And I would say that that question comes up um, fairly often in regards to cats as well. Uh, and most shelters have um, many more cats than dogs, depending on the, the area, the area of the country that I live in, that tends to be the case. And so um, I would say we do exactly what Kristen said, where you prioritize who you're going to write a bio for based on how long they've been with you. Um, you we don't write bios for kittens or for puppies because they fly out the door. Um, so again, you have to sort of take this advice and, and pare it down to what will work for your organization. Um, and, and this is just a general call out to up your marketing game, and there's so many resources out there. We have um, lots of free downloads at the heartspeak.org website. Maddie's Fund has tons of great information on marketing. Um, and I think that being able to start to build up our volunteer forces to take up that cause, I think, is a really great place for us to be investing our time and, and reaching new audiences. So we're pretty much done with our, our slides, but we're ready for some questions. Um, I, I would say that we just want to use this one moment in time to remind you that uh, there's, there's not a lot to gain in perpetuating the breed label, uh, the breed labeling game, so to speak. So um, we hope that, that this presentation has given you some confidence to move forward in those conversations and feel like this isn't as daunting as a task as maybe it seemed even just a year ago. Yes, um, and I think that we, uh, as, as we always talk about, whether we're talking about fostering, whether we're talking about play groups, enrichment, um, the care we give our dogs in our shelter, um, we really, it all comes down to this, this idea that every pet in our care, at this time in animal welfare, every animal in our care should be treated with the same respect and care as our own pet that is sitting at home with us right now. Um, and that by moving away from breed labels, by really thinking of every dog in our care and every cat in our care as an individual being with an individual personality, we're going to make better matches, we're going we're gonna to make better adoptions, and we're going to do better by the animals in our care. And this is possible whether you're a tiny little organization or a big giant shelter. Um, and so remember that resource available through Animal Farm Foundation, that ebook, has all the information we've talked about tonight. So we can take some questions now. Thank you so much, Caitlin and Kristen. Um, we have a lot of questions to go through, um, but we're going to start with this one right here. Many people searching for a pet will search based on breed. How has switching to mixed breed identifiers altered the number of people interested in particular dogs based on web searches? Um, I can take this one. Uh, we, so this is a question that comes up a lot, and it's not unrelated to the uh, question about uh, breed rescue is finding the dogs that they're interested in. Um, we have seen no decrease in adoptions of any dogs. And in fact, in both the organizations that I've made the switch, we've seen an increase in adoptions. Um, we still market those animals through photographs, and we're still marketing them on social media, um, and we're not seeing any decrease. So there's no evidence to suggest that breed is necessary to adopters finding the pets that they're interested in. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Caitlin, did you have anything to add to that? No, I would just uh, agree with exactly what Kristen said. I think that um, what we're finding is that, if anything, this change sort of opens up a lot of new worlds of possibility to some of those adopters who we've really habituated to searching that way. Um, I think that this starts to change that conversation a little bit, but I think in, in many ways it opens up many more possibilities. Great, thank you. Okay, we have our next question up on the screen. 
What are some specific examples of how you train adoption staff to field breed designation questions from potential adopters? Um, yeah, so we, uh, this is Christian, um, this, this goes back to Caitlin's point about org speak and how we forget that the majority of people coming in our organization are getting, they're adopting a pet about as often as uh, someone purchases a mattress. I think it was, uh, I heard Bonnie Brown say that once, and I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, most people, they don't know as much as we think they would, and they might have some assumptions. They might have ideas about what they're looking for, or they might have ideas about the breeds of dogs in front of them. But just like with everything we do, um, it's our responsibility to speak plainly and to speak honestly and to give as honest and accurate of, of information as we can. And so it's important that we train our staff and our volunteers on an ongoing basis to just be as upfront, honest, and to speak in as plain and simple of language as possible and, and not um, the answer to the breed question is fairly simple. Um, it's something we have to repeat and role play. But uh, the, the, larger, the larger cultural change that we want to instill in staff is the harder work. And that larger cultural change involves that when someone asks any question about an animal, whether it's what breed is that or is it potty trained, that's the beginning of a conversation. And that conversation is what's going to lead adopters to the best match for their family. And I would just add um, that I think that whether we put the breed labels on the kennel cards or not or on our shelter software systems, I think it's still a fairly common question. As we were, as we were saying before, like we're so habituated to just sort of asking that question without really thinking about what it, what it really means. Um, I think that one specific example that I've used often is um, when someone comes in and says, I'm looking for a golden retriever. Um, I think that the, the immediate um, answer to that has to be like, that's great. Can you tell me, were you looking for a dog that looks like a golden retriever? Or have you owned one and you're looking for a certain personality trait? I think we have to get to the root of what someone actually means when they ask that question so that we can then guide them um, in one direction or another. So then then the conversation becomes either about they're looking for a specific look of a dog, or they're looking for um, maybe something reminiscent of a past pet that they have. And that's a, that, take, that conversation takes a different form in terms of um, knowing who some of the dogs on, in your organization are and how to guide them in that direction. Mm -hmm. Great answers, guys. OK, on to our next question. What shelter software would you recommend for offering mixed breed options? Well, currently, um, I mean, we, we don't make any recommendations. Currently, the two software systems that we're aware of that are offering mixed breed are um, PetPoint and um, Shelter Love. However, whatever system you're using, um, it's a great idea to contact them and tell them that's something that you'd like to be able to offer because um, the, other, the other software systems are, um, by and large, now allowing on a case-by-case -case basis shelters to use uh, mixed breed or unknown upon request, even if they don't offer it as a blanket option. Great, thank you. Okay, are you suggesting removing breed labels from all dogs? What about that other 25% that could be identified with relative certainty? I think that that goes back to um, something Kristen tackled a little bit earlier in the presentation in that um, if you feel fairly certain that you have a dog in, in your care who is a purebred dog. I, I, we are certainly not arguing for labeling dogs that we think are purebred dogs as mixed breed, but it is important to still have a conversation with your staff about how you still answer those questions. If you are going to, when you're by and large not labeling dogs, when you do make the decision to label one, there has to be a common sort of core understanding that that doesn't mean that we're going to adhere to breed stereotypes. So just because we're calling this dog um, a Doberman Pinscher does not mean that we're going to adhere to all of the sort of mythologized stereotypes about that breed of dog. We're still going to get to know that dog and match make appropriately. 
Thank you, Caitlin. Did you have anything else to add, Kristen? No. <laughs> okay, sounds good. We have our next <laughs> question. Did you find that this affected slash made an impact on the numbers of animals returned to the shelter after adoption? No, and that is a great question. So uh, no, we see no increase in return at either organization where this change has been made, and we have not heard of any organization reporting um, an increase in return. Uh, th that does bring up an important, um, something that we didn't really talk about was uh, what about, do you tell people that have, if someone is adopting a dog that you think may be restricted, what do you do? Are you doing, how are you doing landlord checks? Well, the answer is that we're no, we don't do landlord checks in our organization. We trust people to know um, their, the, what is allowed and what isn't allowed in their housing, and we tell them to check. And we tell them to check regardless of what breed, size, or type of animal they're adopting. We, we advise people to check that any, check their, um, lease or their HOA and make sure they're allowed to have the pet that they want to get. And we haven't seen any increase uh, in returns as a result of letting people make that decision. More and more, um, the, the majority of animals are, are being restricted in apartments and different kinds of housing. And so um, we don't treat any size or type or breed look of dog or um, cat any differently uh, when it comes to that. So. Uh, we have seen, and we've seen no impact on adoption returns. That's great, Kristen. You mentioned report cards for the dogs. I'd love to hear more about that. I think probably I mentioned this early on and then I hit on it a little bit later. We showed those um, kennel report cards we use, and you can download a um, a steal this version from Animal Farm Foundation, um, and those cards are great, especially for higher volume sh um, places or for um, shelters or rescues where time is limited. Um, and I know most of you are probably laughing. That's all of our organizations. Um, those report cards are a quick and easy way to get some some um, key information onto the kennels. Thank you. All right, we're going to get the new question soon. You didn't really answer the housing restriction question. What do you tell someone wanting to adopt a dog that might be on the list of restricted? I think I probably didn't answer that at the time that the person entered that question, but I since kind of addressed that, um, that anytime someone, we, we just advise all of our adopters to check whatever restrictions they may have. and. Um, we trust that people don't want to lose their housing, um, and we, we now know this is true, um, and people do self-regulate. They, uh, they do find out if they can't have a pet, and they, um, they then um, choose not to adopt that pet. And I think I mentioned earlier something that's really sad is when people come into our organization, and this still happens here, that they want um, just a, a larger dog, and we'll have 10 people a day wanting a larger mixed breed dog who can't adopt them because of restrictions. So, um, that's, it's a growing problem for all of us. Thanks for clarifying, Kristen. Do members of the public accuse you of trying to hide something, such as hiding that it's pit, pit bull or another alleged bully breed? Kaylin, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, so I have not found this to be true, but I think that if, if it does come up in conversation, I think it tends to be a really good um, moment to have that conversation that goes in the direction of, you know, there's, there's absolutely nothing that we're trying to hide by removing breed labels. What we're actually trying to do is be more accurate. Um, when, we were, when we're taking a look at animals that come into our care and making a guess at what their breed or breed mix is, that's actually much more inaccurate. And, and sometimes I've, you have to read the person, but I've had, had some level of success sort of joking around that, like, unfortunately, we don't have a machine in the back that we can, like, put them through a scanner and it comes out and says, like, this is a poodle mix. Um, so, you know, up until now, it's been a lot of guess making. And thankfully, at this moment in time, we have enough information to, to be able to say that the most accurate thing for us to do is to not make a guess, but tell me what you're looking for in a pet and, and let me tell you a little bit about this, this particular dog. I think that that is a typically um, successful way to sort of deflect those conversations that go in a more um, sort of accusatory uh, 
direction. Great, thanks, Kate, for answering that. So we will take one more question as we're coming up to the end of our time here tonight. Do the DNA tests look at the 50 breed-related genes or the behavior genes or some of both? Ah, uh, so this is a um, this is a deceptively difficult question. So, so the short answer, because we are at the end of this, is that the DNA test looks at the dog as a whole. Um, what is really important for us to remember is that the way that those DNA tests work, and they've gotten more and more accurate over time since they've been introduced, um, is to break down the history, the sort of genetic history within that dog based on the purebred samples. Um, and so really the take home about the DNA test is that whatever the results come up as, it's just really important for us to provide the guidance um, on the adoption end of things to make sure that people know that it's, it's not a guarantee of anything. So because a dog comes back um, with some DNA results that may indicate Labrador, it does not mean that the dog is going to automatically love to swim or love to fetch or love your child, like all of those sort of breed-based stereotypes. Um, and that goes for the negative breed-based stereotypes. So it's, whether or not you do use DNA tests, um, the real take home comes down to being able to say to them, like, this is very interesting and, and sort of fun for us to know, but it still doesn't predict the future about this dog. Here's what I can tell you about this dog based on our experiences here. And with that answer, we will be ending our event. We want to thank all of you for your time tonight, and a special thank you to Kristen and Caitlin for an amazing presentation. Be sure to join us on February 7th for Target Zero, Best Practice Strategies for Redefining Animal Sheltering. For more information on this webcast and to register, go to our website. This webcast will be available on demand shortly, and we hope you will share this presentation on your social sites. Thanks again for being here with us this evening, and good night.